My name is Pat Dennis. I'm one of the, the kidney transplant social workers here at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. Um, this is actually a day off, so I'm in Yellowstone today. No, I'm not really in Yellowstone. I wish I was. Um, <laughs> we have a wonderful guest speaker today who's um, EJ Tamez, um, and he's the head donor search expert at NKR. Um, and he's going to talk to you about microsite programs here. Now, we also have two other people. One is um, Christine Schneider. Wave at them, Christine. Um, who is our, one of our living donor coordinators, and then Kim Malloy, wave Kim, and Kim is one of our RN pre-coordinators, okay, for the recipient side. So EJ, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, folks, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I'll be on later to, to run the chat, okay? Hi. <laughs> thank you, Pat. Thanks. All right, well, let's get started, guys. Well, thank you for the invite, Pat, and the whole Mayo Florida team. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today. First of all, I'm going to introduce myself and tell you about my story because I think it's 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 kind of uh, good to know that a lot of people, again, out there don't even know about be how they can be a living donor, right? Uh, my story is pretty pecul peculiar because uh, my brother had developed, uh, developed kidney failure, I would say probably about, uh, yeah, in 2016. And my brother was in real bad shape. He was already on dialysis. He had developed gout, which I was assume most of you people understand what gout is, right? And he was having a very hard time, even of course, uh, walking. Um, his my nephew, the youngest nephew on his side of the family, was only five years old, and he wanted to play with his dad, and he couldn't do that, right? Because my brother was barely able to walk. He had lost his job. So anyway, to make a long story short, I went to visit him, and I saw that, and then I realized that. You know, I asked him, I said, have you gone to a transplant center yet? You know, to be on the only thing we knew was the C's donation, right? And he said, no, brother, I have not. I said, well, we need to go. We ended up going to a transplant center. To make a long story short, I'm sitting in the weight room at that transplant center. And I call this lady an angelical nurse, right? Uh, because I was sitting and looking at the floor. I was very uh, sad of what was my brother was going through. Uh, the night before, I saw him going through a peritoneal dialysis, right, in his room, in, in his uh, hotel room. And, you know, I I know he he told me he had to do that every night. And anyway, that was a wake up call to me to try to help him in a way, any way that I could. I didn't know how, though. Um, the angelical nurse, I call her, she walks towards me in the weight room and she asked me, she said, what's wrong with you, sir? And I told her, I said, the problem is my brother's in there getting checked up by the nephrologist and there's nothing I can do for him. Well, she looked at me and she smiled and she said, well, have you thought about being a donor yourself? And my eyes went wide open, right? Because I thought only deceased people could donate. So I literally thought she was trying to kill me, in other words, right? <laughs> she smiled and she said, oh, you don't understand. Come follow me, I'll show you the way. And she did, I completed the questionnaire online, which now it can be done on the microsites, which I'm going to walk you through. And by the way, from that day on, uh, she she asked me, she had, she said, which way you want to go? Because you can either tell your brother or you can keep it to yourself. Right. And later on, once you get approved, just let him know that your intent is to donate on his behalf. Well, I, I opted for the later one. Right. I didn't want to provide my brother with any false hope. And I said, I'm not going to tell him until I'm approved. I sure did. Within a couple, I would say about a couple months, they called me back and said, guess what? You are healthy enough to be a donor for your brother. So feel free to let him know. I did. And, and something very important, too, in my story is the fact that he tried to convince me not to donate to him. OK, throughout the whole journey before our donation. Why is that? The lack of education. Right. People think that when you become a living donor, that your life is going to suffer, that you're going to be not living a normal life, so on and so forth, right? That's why it's so important to educate everybody on what living donation is all about. Anyway, that's my story. And uh, with that, I'm going to start with the training. Uh, like uh, we talked about earlier, you, you can stop me at the end of the call and, and we can uh, answer any questions. Is there, is this, if it's something that you want to bring up immediately, feel free to raise your hand and we'll take care of it, okay? How to find a living kidney donor. Again, Mayo Clinic, I'm also doing the training for some of you dialysis centers as well. 
Here's a key uh, slide. Who can donate, right? Uh, most of you guys are aware of, about this already. H, the minimum H to donate varies by center. Of course, there's a no upper H limit. It's all dependent on health, right? But most centers are at least 21, 23 years old. Some centers are open to even 18 years old, right? Um, the blood type, this is where NKR comes in, right? Blood type is no longer an issue. If you have a family member that wants to uh, that, that wants to donate on your behalf as a patient, as long as you go through the NKR process and through a transplant center, of course, like Mayo that participates in the NKR, the blood type issue is already uh, solved. I would say solved, right? Because you still need a compatible kidney, but you can pull a kidney from the from the from the I would call it the pool once somebody donates on your behalf, right? Or you can go uh, participate on, on the pair donation, uh, chain, you name it, right? There's so many possibilities out there that the, the blood type is no longer an issue, right? Donors most being good physical and mental health. We all know that, uh, especially the transplant center, of course. Uh, BMI, BMI is different by center as we know it, right? Some centers are more uh, open to taking people up to 35, Some centers are a little more strict, you know, 30, 32. It just depends on the center, right? Potential donors may be disqualified. They have a serious medical condition. This is something we'll talk in a, bit, in a little bit more about in a minute, but when a potential uh, donor comes forward and, the, and the, the patient is like, well, I don't know if he could be or she could be a donor because the person doesn't look healthy enough. We encourage our patients not to be the judge for that, right? <laughs> Let the transplant center be the judge because they're the, the professional medical team that would actually decide if somebody is able to donate, okay? Um, don't pre, uh, preconceive, have a notion of somebody that because they may have an issue, you don't know if that person may qualify or not. The transplant center is the ones that take care of that, okay? Understanding living kidney donation. What is it? An individual donates one kidney for transplant, transplantation to another person. When? Once medical eligibility com is confirmed, right? Um, where? At the participating transplant center. And I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit more on that because uh, geographically, there's no longer an issue. If you go through the microsite program, a potential donor can donate on a patient that's in Mayo, at Mayo, Florida on the listed But the, the potential donor could live in New York and they could actually get worked up and potentially donate at NYU, Cornell, with no issues at all towards the patient that is at Mayo, Florida, okay? Why? Minimal risk, kidney health maintained, donor assistance helps another person regain their life, okay? So this is what a microsite looks like. Um, this is a great example, uh, a young man named Oliver Mayer, who, by the way, got his kidney, a uh, living donor kidney, back in uh, January of this year. And Oliver, his mom, and his whole team had an amazing, uh, uh, what do you call it, a, a presentation, an amazing, they did a great job on putting together their story. Um, actually, Oliver, before I go into the details, he not only received one kidney, He, there were actually two more living donors that came through his uh, website that donated as family vouchers, right? And I'll explain to you in a minute what a family voucher is about. But his website yielded not only one, but three total living donations, okay? Um, it's a free personalized website designed to help patients search for a donor. A site can be easily shared through email, social media, and face-to-face. -face. This business cards here that you see in the middle This is very important because automatically when somebody registers for a microsite and the transplant center approves that person to participate in the program, they're going to be receiving 250 of these business cards physically. And these business cards are very important because they can actually be shared through social media. They can Facebook, Instagram. You can actually hand these business cards out as you talk to people, right? Um, and the key too on this is the fact that when you hand these cards out, you can uh, you can ask the people depending on uh, on who they are. Um, you can tell them, hey, can you please share my story? Right, that's all you're asking people. You're not asking them, can you donate your kidney? Right, and we'll talk more a, a little bit more about that in a minute. 
And by the way, there's 250 business cards are handed out by the patient. NKR will automatically send them more, right? They just have to let us know that they need more cards and they're free of charge. And we'll send them, of course, we'll be happy to send them because that means that person is working on, 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 on sharing their story, right? It's a way for potential donors to easily and confidentially register. And I'll talk a little, a little bit more on that, but it's basically if a person clicks on this button on the bottom of their microsite, the automatically the intake uh, medical questionnaire starts, their profile and then the medical questionnaire. And that person can register that potential donor through the patient's website, okay? It's a platform that provides you with the tools to succeed and here's a key part, including a coach who has been there themselves and can help you in your search. I'm going to talk a little bit about the microsite coaches in a minute, and I'm going to show you some of the coaches' stories, which are very compelling. And by the way, a coach is always going to be available to the patient whenever the patient is starting to try to go from a starter site to a custom site like this and write a compelling story and add photos, okay? The difference between a starter site, anybody that registers on a microsite and the, and the transplant center, in this case, Mayo, Florida, approves that person to have a microsite, is going to have a starter site automatically, right? A starter site includes the name and age of the person. It's shared on social media. And again, like I mentioned, we will be supplying that patient with 250 business cards automatically. Now, once they talk to the coach or even the patient, they feel confident enough they can start working on their personal story and customizing their site, right? And by the way, the URL address and the page will always remain the same, whether they're on starter site or custom site. So we don't have, we always encourage patients once they have their starter site active, start sharing your page and your story because even during a starter site, they can actually have people potentially start the intake medical questionnaire process, right? Um, again, when they become a custom site, either through the coach or by themselves, they can add photos and they can add a personalized story, which again, we try to help the patient to write a very compelling story, right? To share on social media. Okay. This is a way, and, and again, this QR code is specifically for Mayo, Florida. So feel free to take a picture of it if you like to. But if you scan this code, it's gonna take you to this uh, intake or this web link, right? It's gonna have this six digit code in here under the campaign that refers to Mayo, Florida. And as long as a patient starts filling out everything else in here, all their profile information, once they click register, that submission is gonna to go to Mayo, Florida, okay, to their system. And then Mayo is gonna open it up and say, oh, okay, we have a patient that wants to be either start the workup process to be listed at our center, or they may be already listed, right, at Mayo, Florida, but they want a microsite, right? They wanna start participating on the microsite program. So it doesn't, you specifically don't have to register people. As, lo as long as you provide them with this uh, link or this code, they can register themselves into the program, okay? So this is what it looks like. Once the, the, the patient registers, self-registers, they're gonna receive an email to the email they utilize for registration. And on this email is gonna say, congratulations, we have confirmed your registration and activated your starter website. To view your site, click here. And then to start personalizing and they feel confident enough, they can click on this link. And I'll show you what that comes up with, right? Uh, again, if a, a patient is not uh, capable or is not very, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, knowledgeable about social media, the coach is going to reach out to them, right? And it, the coach is going to help them and walk them through the process with no problem, okay? This is what the link looks like when you want to start personalizing your website. The, the patient and the coach can write up to 2,500 characters on this first section on the top and another 2,500 characters on this other section on the bottom. The coaches have written many, many stories. They have a lot of pointers to utilize, right? And I'll talk about a, a few of those pointers here in a minute on the next slide, but I'll give you an instance. Uh, one of them is actually a lot of people or patients are always eager to show a lot of photos, right, on their website. They say, oh, I wanna show my friends, my family, and mostly, of course, it's going to be adults, right? Friends, family. 
Well, the coach is going to tell them, that's great. If you show a lot of people in your photos, it's, it's a great thing. But always keep in mind that people on the other side of the screen are going to be asking, well, how many of those patients have gotten tested, right, before they commit themselves to being tested themselves? So I always try to, we always try to uh, let the uh, patient know, you always have to have an answer to that, right? If, if your uh, immediate family has already tried donating and they've been disqualified, you can write that on, as part of your story, right? You can put a statement in there saying, by the way, my immediate family tried to be a, a donate on my behalf, but they, they, they were disqualified due to pre-existing conditions, right? And those are the items that, that the coach will be able to provide and the leads to the patient so they can write a compelling story and they have a better story out there to find a living donor, right? This is a slide I wanted to show as well. This is our uh, history of microsites. Very, very compelling. You can see here back in Q1 in January of 2019, we only had eight microsites out there, right? Uh, by the way, right now, we're over 2,900. And I haven't updated the graph, but we have 2,900 microsites. We're gonna close the year. Our goal is to have 3,000 microsites, right? Now, microsites are great, but on the other side, how, how effective are we, right? How many transplant, living donor transplants have we facil facilitated through microsites? We got over 350 already. I think the last time I saw it, it was about 370. And again, our goal is to get to 400 for the year, which I think we're on the way to get that, right? So we're going to get up to 400 living donor transplants historically since the first day we introduced microsites to NKR. OK. And by the way, here's a, a good breakdown between we talked about active starter and active custom. Right. Currently, there are some, again, patients out there that they enroll in the microsite. The coaches have made contact with them, but they still don't feel confident enough to start writing their own personal story. We respect that. Right. We have a lot of respect for those patients because some patients may say, hey, I'm not ready to, to do that yet. But as we go forward. If you coach me, if you guide me through the process, I may, I may feel confident enough to participate. So we respect that, right? Uh, again, we always tell the, the patient that they're gonna have a better chance to find a living donor by creating a custom site, okay? Here's a great uh, slide as well. Um, what is the ideal donor search team, right? Um, again, in the middle, we'll have the patient, and don't get me wrong, a lot of patients out there, they may only have one person or sometimes not even anybody that be able to help them through their journey, right? So it, it, it could be the same person could actually wear different hats, but in the ideal team, you will have an administrator, a caretaker. Again, you already have a coach once you participate in the Microsoft program and champions, you know, what are champions? Champions are those people that are out there sharing your story, right? either through word of mouth, through social media, email, text, calls, you name it, right? Those champions, again, like I talked earlier, they need to know already if they were not able to donate or pre-disqualify, right? Because what happens is if a potential donor approaches, I mean, a, a champion approaches me and says, EJ, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find a living kidney donor for this patient. Can you help? Sure, okay, have you been tested yourself, right? That was That's gonna be my first question, right? And the champion needs to understand that, that they need to have a, an answer to that question because that's very important so that you're able to be more effective when you're approaching potential donors, okay? And this is the slide that I brag about all the time. Uh, this is my team and I'm very, very happy. I'll tell you real quick a little bit about each of these uh, coaches, Terry Bennett, by herself, she was an advocate for her son, right? Her son needed a kidney a few years ago, and Terry was able to advocate for him and find him a living donor, right? Uh, Brian, Brian is actually a recipient himself. Brian is married to Marie Drain. Uh, Brian did a great job. He he was the one going through the through the process, right? And Marie was her his advocate, right? And and again, they were able to find a living donor. And now they're both coaches for our NKR team. Tyra, on the other hand, Tyra is a double donor herself. And by the way, she's based in Florida. And uh, it was amazing. Tyra not only donated her kidney, right? She donated part of her liver a few years later, right? 
And now she's a full-time coach with us, with NKR. And another peculiar part about Tara, she used to be a coordinator, right, in Colorado at a transplant center a few years ago. Then she moved to Florida and worked in the medical field. And then uh, we heard about her and we brought it into the team. And she's doing amazingly as a coach within NKR. Debbie is another great coach. Debbie actually was an advocate for her husband. Her husband needed a kidney. And Debbie was able to find her husband a living donor kidney, right? We talked about Marie. Mike Saylor, amazing story. And this is why it's so important because some people feel discouraged once their inner circle, their immediate family is not able to approach to approach them and say, hey, I want to be a living donor. Well, Mike, nobody within his immediate family donated to him. It was a former high school student that he went to school with. Once he started sharing his, his social media campaign and his uh, microsite, he had somebody through the social media platform donate on his behalf. So Mike walked that road as a recipient, right? And Luis, Luis also has a very peculiar story. And by the way, if you need Spanish speaking skills, Luis and I take that, wear that hat, right? Because in the old days before Luis came on board, like about nine months ago, everything fell on my shoulders, right? And Luis came in and took a big load off my shoulders because he's bilingual himself. I was actually his coach about nine months ago when he went through his living donation here in Texas. And Luis has a very peculiar story as well, because initially he didn't want to share his story. You know how we are already. And we talk about us men, right? That we don't, sometimes we don't want to share our story. We say, oh, we'll wait a little bit. Uh, well, Luis started sharing his business cards, right? And one of his coworkers utilized that business card to actually uh, register and ended up donating to Luis. Okay, so very, very, very nice story as well. Who do champions and patients reach out to? This is a, a very good slide as far as how do you start your search, right? As a patient, as a microsite patient, right? First, you're gonna start with your inner family, right? And with your inner family, as you know, there are people you talk to every day. There's no issues, you can be more open to them and say, hey, by the way, I need a kidney. Have you ever thought about being a living donor, right? And I, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then you go out to your friends, right, and acquaintances. And then finally, you go out to strangers, right? I've had people that post their URL for their microsite in the back of their car's windshield. And they've been successful with that, right? They've utilized magnets on the doors of their vehicles. They put, they put lawn uh, signs in front of their cars. I mean, I'm sorry, in front of their homes, in front of their apartments. And they've been very successful with those initiatives. Right. So there's there's so many different ways you can share your story and be effective at it. Right. So ways to say to what to say to potential donors. Right. This is where I was talking about earlier. How do you approach your family? Would you be willing to be tested to see if you're medically qualified to donate more straight? You have that you have built that network with them. You, you feel more confident to talking to them about exactly what you need. When you approach, approach friends, is a little different, right? I'm asking all my friends whether they're willing to be tested to see if they're medically qualified to donate. Is that something you will consider, right? You're a little bit more, you know, giving them more space, in other words, right? When you talk to acquaintances, it's a little more different as well. I'm looking for a kidney donor. Do you know anybody who may be willing to be tested to see if they are medically qualified to donate, right? You're, you're a little more uh, indirect, in other words, right? And when you talk to strangers, the main thing to keep in mind is you're just asking them to share your story, right? You're not asking them for a living kidney, right? You're telling them, hey, do you mind sharing my story? Because by you doing that, you're already helping me, right? And you never know if it's something that they have in themselves, they may end up registering to potentially be your living kidney donor, right? Methods to communicate, right? Talk to a person. I already talked about some of this already. Phone calls, letters. Again, share your story through the microsite, social media posts. A lot of people, and, and including people that may not be very savvy with, uh, with, with uh, what do you call it, computers or social media, what they end up doing is taking a photo with their smartphone of that, of that business card and texting it to their friends and family. Because guess what? By somebody else scanning that code, they're gonna go to that person's microsite, right? 
T-shirts, bumper stickers, billboards, you name it, right? <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, your microsite is live. Use it to get the word out. This is exactly the same thing we talked earlier about. This is what the business, business card looks like. You can hand out the cards, leave the cards at work, at church, community centers, public places, libraries, text the link, email the microsite link. So many different ways to share your story, right? This is very important. A lot of patients, and, and again, most of you guys understand about HIPAA compliance, and we know that, right? But some patients don't, right? And we need to educate our patients on that, right? So they need to understand that the donors are going to be protected, right? No information is ever going to be disclosed to a potential uh, recipient or a patient regarding a donor, right? So what we encourage uh, patients to have if those potential donors have come forward to you and told you about their intent, we encourage those patients to keep a list, right? This is not necessary, but it will give you a little more peace of mind that you know exactly of the people that are going through the process, excuse me, and they're thinking about potentially becoming a living donor to you, right? So this is a way to feel a little bit less stress, if you want to call it. And you know exactly where each person may be on the on the process. And keep in mind, right? Some people may not disclose the fact that they want to be your living donor, and we have to respect that. And the center will never disclose that information to you. Okay. Talk to a living donor mentor. This is another great program that uh, NKDO, by the way, it's called. <laughs> Excuse me. It's uh, I used to be a living donor mentor before I came full time with NKR. A living donor mentor is simply a person that has donated before and that has walked that process as a living donor. So when uh, a potential donor comes through the process and the system, guess what? They're connected with a living donor mentor and the mentor will reach out to that potential donor and provide their testimony so that potential donor understands a little bit more and hears from somebody who has previously donated, right? That whole program is very successful, by the way. We measure the data, and people that talk to a living donor mentor are four times more, there's a four times chances to, be a, to become a donor than somebody that does not talk to a living donor mentor. So very compelling, very important to encourage potential donors to talk to a living donor mentor, okay? Donor search tips, okay? Uh, potential champions should have a clear reason why they can't donate. We talked about this already. I won't talk uh, uh, more about that. Uh, never say you have a donor until surgery is done. This is very, very important that we educate our patients on. A lot of times people create the story, they start using their social media, and guess what? Somebody with their, their family says, hey, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna get tested. And don't stop your search, right? Don't stop your campaign be until the surgery occurs, right? Until you have that kidney inside of your stomach. And why do I say that is the fact that anything can happen, right? It's better to have more people getting through the process of getting pre-qualified and going through the workup and having the center working with them than having one person that you may think is gonna be a living donor. And guess what? They may be disqualified, right? Something may go wrong with that person or they may just say, I don't wanna do it anymore. And guess what? you end up not having the other people that were thinking about going through that process, right? Um, you can talk someone into donating, so don't try. This is very, very important as well. When you start sharing your story and you wanna convince somebody to be a donor, don't do that because if it's in, in themselves and they feel like they wanna do it, nothing's gonna stop them to become a living donor, right? Um, especially, again, I'll talk, from my perspective, when I, I, I saw my brother dealing with his issues, nothing out there was gonna stop me from becoming a living donor to him, right? And if I didn't have it in me, I'd probably say, I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna go through the process, right? And we have to respect that, right, on people. Anyone could be a potential donor, so don't rule people out. We talked about this already, you know, not be, because you see somebody that may have some kind of issue, or, we're not medically qualified, right? The transplant center are the ones that do the pre-workups and that screen people to potentially be a living donor. Leave that to the professionals, okay? Why compatibility is no longer important? I talked a little bit about that earlier. Very, very important. A lot of people, we encourage patients to never post their blood type 
on their social media campaigns, right? Why do we say that? Because keep in mind, anybody that posts a blood type, their blood type on social media, they're going to have people that are going to be, oh, well, I'm not a compatible blood type to that patient, so I'll forget it. I'm not going to be able to donate. That immediately is disqualifying potential donors, right? You only need a living donor. That's all you need. Thanks to the NKR and what the transplant centers have come up with, you can actually have a pair donation, uh, a chain. You can so many different ways. The voucher program, which I'll talk a little bit about that, which is very powerful. It's another way to do it. Okay. The voucher program. This is very, very important. A lot of people, and I'm not going to talk on uh, on every aspect of it. I'm just going to touch on some very important uh, items of why the voucher is so so powerful. One of them we already talked about the blood type compatibility through the voucher program that is eliminated, right? Because you're donating to the pool with an NKR and in return, you're receiving a standard voucher because you're currently in immediate need of a kidney as a patient, right? So when somebody, again, the, the key part about the voucher program to understand is eliminates co compatibility issues. Number two, let's say your donor, is, it's in the military, right? Or it's a school teacher. And their window to donate is in the summertime, right? Let's say a school teacher can donate within June and August, right? The time frame when they're off of not not at school, right? So guess what? They can donate within that window, and then when the patient is ready to receive their living donor transplant, guess what? They can receive their kidney. Let's say three months, four months down the road, whenever whenever that best match is available to that recipient, right? So that's another way that. The voucher program is so powerful. And by the way, with the voucher, somebody donating to the voucher program, the, the patient no longer may have the chance to lose that donor because that donor previously donated towards that patient, right? So that's another very compelling fact about the voucher program, right? Tell potential donors about Donor Shield. Uh, and again, most of us know about NALDAC, right? Which is the federal uh, grants that uh, potential uh, that donors receive, right? But uh, Donor Shield is like NALDAC on steroids, right? <laughs> donor Shield actually provides up to now, which we just changed it, eighteen thousand dollars of benefits potentially for a living donor, right? They include two thousand dollars, up to two thousand dollars for wage reimbursement. Let's say the donor, and I talked to one day a donor, a potential donor that works for UPS, right? You know that, and we all know that, that when you go through surgery, you're not going to be able to lift anything heavy for a while, right? So this potential donor was very, very uh, thankful through Donor Shield that she had, she could be out of work for as long as needed if their wages, her, her wages were going to be reimbursed, right? Then we also have, as you know, uh, if that potential donor, God forbid, ever needs a kidney, which chances are very slim, because we haven't had that yet, right? And we've got, conducted over 8,000 living donor transplants. If that person ever needs a kidney, they're prioritized, right? For, kid, for a living donor kidney, since they already donated through NKR, okay? Um, again, we talked about Donor Connect, remote donation. I already talked to you about that. The potential donor can get worked up and potentially donate at a center other than, again, in this case, Mayo, Florida, where the patient may be registered at, right? I wanna talk a little quick about this one. This is very important too, and I missed it, but we now have, let's say somebody completes a medical questionnaire and then they go to the next step, which is actually getting their pre-workup labs, right? Their workup, their, their blood work done. Well, now it's very important to know that that person doesn't even have to leave their home to do their blood work test, right? We can have a phlebotomist immediately go to their house and pull their blood work at home. Very convenient way for a potential donor to get worked up, right? They don't even have to go to Quest themselves anymore. If they feel so like doing it, they can have the phlebotomist come to their home, okay? Kidney for life. This is something very, very important to, to bring up as well. Uh, NKR participates along as well with other centers on the Kidney for Life program. Uh, Kidney for Life is it's extremely successful because most of us may not be very uh, uh, educated on low epilepsy mismatch, but we know that the, the better the match to that patient, 
from the donor perspective to the patient, the less immunosuppression potentially that person could take going forward, right? And the longevity of that kidney may be longer, right? Because they have a better match, right? And a lot of things take, come into account when we know we, we talk about the longevity of that kidney, but kidney for life, better matches, better outcomes, right? And this is another uh, set of different uh, platforms that we utilize. Um, again, resources, you already probably know about the NKR main website. And by the way, this is getting close to 8,200, <laughs> not to brag about it, but uh, as well as the Kidney for Life we talked about, Donor Shield, we have our own platform where anybody can go in there and learn about all the different protections for living kidney donors. And we have, of course, the Find a Kidney website, right? This is, we always try to share this with our patients because within this website, you will be able to read about every coach's testimony and their stories. You will also read about other patients that have gone through the microsite program and found their kidney, right? So it's, it's, it's very important information to share with our patients so they can go to one place and pull out a lot of information, okay? That's basically it. And I apologize, I think I, I'm right on time, about 40 minutes. And I open it up to questions. Anybody has any questions, anything that I could bring up and I'm open in the chat, is the microsite for all transplant facilities? That's a great question. Um, Cheryl, the, the microsites, uh, the NKR microsite program is currently with 51 transplant centers in the country, okay? And of course, Mayo Florida participates in the microsite program. Uh, besides Mayo, there's other 50 out there. But here's a key part that I talked about once you're on a microsite, you open up not only to those 51 centers, you open up to 102 centers within the U.S. that NKR participates with. So hopefully that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pat, if there's any other questions. Um, there, had, there had been a prior question about how to get like brochures and that kind of thing. So I gave them the link to your website. Awesome. And that comes directly to me because I take care of those. So I, oh, I'll make sure I'll send those to, to whoever needs them with no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was also, um, can the slides be available for the training? And I said I would send them out, but can yeah. you send me your updated one? I, I will send you this one and I'll send it to you and, and you can distribute it as needed. Yeah. I'll email it out. So okay. any other questions for, for you guys? Are you... Um, we just wanted the dialysis center people to be aware of this stuff. Yeah. So um, if this is something we're we're promoting in our center early on in the process. So um, maybe Kim, you can talk about how we're getting that out when the patients first come to us. Well, they, they we have included a pamphlet into the folder that we give to the patients, but then once they're approved, they are get sent a communication with the information also, which is typically when they're setting up the microsite is when they're approved. Exactly. And by the way, there's a question there about, uh, you, and you know where that uh, link is, right, Pat? If you don't, if you want to share it with them, or I can send uh -huh. it. I can post it. Which link? Which link? The uh, one with the NKR Microsoft Participant Centers. I can open uh -huh. it up real quick and post it on the chat with no problem. You know, Here. when you when the patients meet with the dialysis social workers too, uh, with the I'm sorry, with the transplant social workers, we also reinforce that the microsites are out there. And for our patients, we also have a um, a um, um, <laughs> we have recordings of all our education videos out there. So we tell them, and we have a recording of this presentation that EJ did for us in the past. Um, so that's out there for them, right? Um, to review. And I'm going to email you that link of all the microsite participant centers because I wasn't able to add it. Actually, I think I got it. <laughs> yeah, you no problem. Um, let me see if I can. Was there any other questions? I apologize while I'm doing. Yeah, it, uh, can a patient do this at any time, or do they have to be active on the on the list first? Great question. <laughs> you want to take that over, or I can take it. It don't matter. They they can do it at any time, but we prefer to do it when they're approved okay. because if they have several 
they may not get approved mm -hmm. and they may have several donors. And so that would create a lot of work for, you know, do it the, the, the microsite if they're not approved, if they were never a candidate. Right. And the microsite should be at a facility that the person is, is going to get a transplant because all of those donors are going to be directed to fill out and those people at that center are the experts on their own policies. Right. I mean, we're always happy to share our policies and our guidelines with how we screen uh, for donors. Um, but if a donor uses our direct link, but uh, the recipient is at another center, there's got to be a means besides, you know, just sharing that information. So it's always best for them to go directly. But we would consider it in certain situations. Great. Now, if a patient is listed at multiple centers, can their microsite go to multiple center or does it just go to one? It's multiple centers, Pat. What happens is when you have a microsite, you already open up to all the centers. So a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to open up two microsites because I'm multi-listed. That won't work because you're not going to have a better benefit by having two microsites, one at each center. It does It defeats the purpose. And I can see that in the system. It's a double entry, right? but we eliminate one of them. But one microsite already opens the door to 102 transplant centers, right? That's the key fact to know. Mm -hmm. And the donor can pick the center that right. they choose to donate. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, that's very important to know, like you said, Christine, because the fact is, like I mentioned on my presentation, you could live in New York, right? You wanna donate at NYU, but your intended recipient, it's a male, right, Florida. Guess what? You don't even have to travel to Florida to donate on that person's behalf, which is incredible, right? I think that's touching on a question in the chat that if a yeah. patient has a living donor in another state or city, the donor could donate their kidney locally and the patient could get a voucher um, to use in their own area. Or the surgeries can also be coordinated to happen at the same time, exactly. depending on the time frame for the donor and the recipient. Exactly. If if the kidney is compatible with the recipient, NKR will fly it over to to you guys center, right? And so even if it's not, I mean, they still can choose to participate as a pair exactly. versus a voucher. But exactly. voucher is always a great option, especially for donors that have you know specific time frames that they're looking to work on to get a surgery completed. Exactly. Great questions. I'm glad to see all those. One other question. I'm thinking of maybe a patient's partner or caregiver wants to donate. They're both recovering. You're right. It, it could cause some issues. So um, in that process there, um, having the donor donate as an advanced donor works out very well. We use this uh, uh process a lot. So the donor donates, the recipient can be the caregiver for the donor while they're recovering. The donor heals for a few weeks. The recipient can then be activated for their voucher, and then the donor will be healed well enough to care for the recipient at that point in time. So that does um, come in very handy for a lot of parties. Exactly. Well, there's another question out there. Does this include Puerto Rico? International. Again, every center is different, right? There are centers out there, and I think you guys are one of them, that are willing to work with international donors, right? Um, you know, as long as, again, through the microsite program, the way we handle international donors is this way. When they start the process, they registered, and then they put an address that's outside of the U.S., overseas, anywhere, right? Uh, again, Puerto Rico is a U.S. address, right? But let's say they're in Mexico, Europe, whatever. They, the way that it works is that person does not have to pick a quest diagnostic, right? then that referral will go directly to you. And you guys are willing, if you're willing to entertain that potential donor, then you, you reach out to that donor and say, hey, you have to conduct pre-workup labs within your country and provide those to us. And that's how the whole process starts, right? 
that. Yeah, so Puerto Rico being U.S. territory, it right. does work. Um, right. It does get a little bit more complicated when you have an international donor, especially for cross-matching, because you can't ship blood internationally. Right. It gets held up at customs. Right. Um, so we do require a donor to come to the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. for some of the specific tests, because there aren't any NKR centers that are located right. internationally. <laughs> exactly. And then... Let's see. Do some centers require the voucher donor to be alive? A voucher donor would always be alive in this situation. Um, this is only for living donation. Um, you know, the deceased side of things is a little bit different. Uh, Pat and Kim may be able to speak better on that. Um, but if somebody is um, passing away, they can share their wishes with their family. It's not a voucher at that point in time. Yeah. If somebody donates, though gets the voucher and then the donor dies and the voucher is still good right because oh yeah i mean if, if the person donates and i think maybe that's the question oh is that what you yeah, okay, I yeah, think yeah, that's yeah. what they were asking yeah. right if a that's person good. donates and the donor accidentally dies the voucher is still good yeah, the voucher is always yeah, the voucher's good already, until it's cashed in. Yeah. Correct. It's yeah. something to bring up very, very important because this is something that came up probably about five. You probably are already familiar with that five, six months ago. But let's say you uh, donate a standard voucher to a, a a patient, right? Currently listed, right? You can actually also name backup vouchers, right? Yeah, and I think it's something fire. very important for people to know because let's say that potential recipient, again, God forbid, passes away right? No longer is listed for whatever reason. And you had already given him a voucher. Well, guess what? You still have five family vouchers, backup vouchers. So you didn't donate with no purpose. You right. donated and you still have family members that could receive that living donation if God forbid ever, they ever need one, right? And whoever it would comes. be whoever cashes in the voucher exactly. first, first is who uses it. It's only good for one person out oh. of the five that you name. Exactly. Yep. Thank you, Christine. Of course. So any other questions, guys? Did you find this useful? I, I just think it's a really neat thing to do. I, I think it's something that should have been done a long time ago, and I'm so glad that NKR is doing this. Um, no, um, answer the question. A voucher does not only transfer to family members. It could be a friend. It could be a neighbor um, in addition to a family member. Right. Correct. You could name five people um, on that voucher name. Exactly. Any people, anybody. Anybody. Any, any five names. Yep. As long as, and you guys already know, the family is not an imminent need of a kidney, right? right. Yeah. yeah, one yeah, one person in imminent need within a year that right. needs a transplant, five others right. Right. Um, that don't. Right. Okay. Well, I appreciate EJ, I appreciate you doing this again for us. It's really helpful information. And I think we just got to keep spreading the word. Yeah. And Christine and Kim, again, thank you for doing this too. Anything that helps our patients is a good thing in my book. Absolutely. So, thank you. Thank, thank you for all. the invite, thank Pat. You. Great seeing you, Christine, Kim. And again, if anybody has questions, feel free to share my contact information, Pat. I'm always okay. willing to help. Reach out, talk to potential donors, you name it, right? I'm here to help. Okay. Before we disconnect, one more question. You could oh. list the donor's children to receive a voucher. Absolutely. Definitely. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. You thank can. you for catching that, Christine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a good day. And everybody, enjoy your holidays. Happy we'll holidays. You guys as well. Take care. <laughs> Have a good Take one. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.